Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to Arup's Digital Horizon series, the London installation. Um, this is one of five events happening across the world today. Um, we've already had brilliant sessions in Melbourne, in Hong Kong, in Amsterdam. We're in London now, and in a couple of hours' time, we'll be kicking off in Los Angeles. The purpose of these events is to bring together clients and collaborators um, across Arup's work to talk about the opportunities that digital is creating in delivering net zero and nature positive solutions. And I'm really delighted with the, the incredible range of clients and collaborators we've got with us in London today. I'll introduce them as we go through the evening. We've got four separate presentations and then we're gonna have a, a Q&A session at the end. Um, so there will be an opportunity for those in the room to ask questions of the, of the panel, but also for people online, please feel free to put questions in the chat and we'll pick those up and, uh, and put as many as we can to the panel at the end of the, the, end of the session. Um, in addition to that, um, we're gonna have a short introductory video from Arup's global leader of digital services, Will Cavendish, who's with us in the room as well. Um, and we'll then move on with our, our presentation. So welcome, enjoy yourselves, and I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, the amazing stories that we've got lined up today. So if we could cue Will's video, please. Welcome from me to Digital Horizons, a whole day showcasing the opportunities, challenges and debates about the role of digital in our world. I'm delighted to be able to kick things off with a short presentation about what we in Arab have learnt and think about some of these issues. First, we know the built environment challenge is growing and profound. Over the next couple of decades, the world's population will rise to 10 billion, and we need to meet their needs in an equitable fashion. Their needs for habitation, their needs for energy, for water, for transportation. Within that, two and a half billion more people will be living in cities, cities that we need to plan, design and build. In other parts of the world, most of the buildings that we need have already been built. Another challenge for us to face. And of course, we need to do all of this while we're living within planetary boundaries, particularly the planetary boundaries of carbon and nature plus. So we're going to need to meet the needs of more people in more equitable ways, while at the same time making sure we preserve our planet. Now, the good news is that there are some great new and existing digital technologies that can help us with this task. And in Arab, we think there are six really significant ones that are going to be useful for us. The power of artificial intelligence and machine learning, allowing us to explore big data in new ways and provide new insights about the challenges we face. The proliferation of data that's coming from sensors, drones and satellite technology, op offering new opportunities and new frontiers for our understanding. The ability to develop and deploy digital twins for both simulation and optimization of operations and asset management. The power of the Internet of Things 5G networks and cloud computing in providing a modern, scalable technology infrastructure to the built environment. The ability of generative design to, to use algorithms to design things in different ways and better ways than we've been able to do before. And the on onset of robotics and automation as new tools, new solutions, new opportunities for us. These six technologies, we believe, are very powerful and offer us great opportunities in our work going forward. And on the back of those, we already know that digital can critically enable the pathway to net zero, to climate resilience and to nature. For example, the ability to use generative algorithms to design buildings in different ways than we've been able to previously and optimise a whole range of complex factors to improve outcomes. In some cases, reducing embodied carbon by up to 50% over a more traditional design. Or indeed, using the power of data and analytics and structural modelling to improve significantly the climate resilience of buildings portfolios with an opportunity cost of perhaps three trillion dollars of savings and improvement across our building stock around the world. Or the ability to use earth observation data to both map and improve biodiversity net gain 
So contributing significantly to Nature Plus. So digital enabling net zero, climate resilience and Nature Plus, but also digital enhancing our ability to meet human needs. Our ability again to use satellite data to map cities and districts at a level we've never been able to do previously, to design nature-based solutions that bring the power of green, blue and grey infrastructure to improve the functioning, livability and biodiversity of our cities. Things like smart buildings platforms that allow us to take the enormous power of data in, inside our buildings to improve human well-being, improve occupancy and also reduce significant energy, perhaps by up to 30% of traditional buildings, and the ability to use digital twins to map, analyse, understand and take, the, through, take us through the pathway of shifting towards a more decentralised, more resilient, more renewable energy system, absolutely vital to the future of our energy and absolutely vital to the future of the pathway to net zero. So digital tools, techniques, capabilities, also enhancing our ability to meet human needs. However, there's always a but. Firstly, when we step back and look at the pace of digitisation in the built environment, the truth is it's only just started. Compared to other sectors that are much more advanced, digitisation is at its early stages, for example, in something like construction. Now, the corollary of that is that we're going to need all to put in a huge effort and huge investment to create the kinds of technology, data and digital infrastructures that are going to be needed and on which many of our digital solutions are going to need to sit. And that's going to be costly over the next 10 to 20 years. Very hard to estimate how much, but tens if not hundreds if not more billions of dollars are going to be required to be invested in the sector in order to create the fundamental platform of digitization that we need. Secondly, unlike other well-known technology sectors, particularly consumer technology sectors, where whole new companies or whole new technologies seem to come out, of the, the, you know, come, out of, come out of the blue and get implemented very quickly. Think of the current debate around something like ChatGPT. In our world, it's different. We live in a world of deep tech, where our solutions need to be rooted in engineering and science, where research takes time, where it takes time to develop the solutions, scale them, prove them, and make them available and usable in the world of buildings, construction, and infrastructure. And not only does it take more time, but it also means that the whole sector needs to work much more closely in partnership. Incumbent firms, startups, governments, regulators, financiers, venture capitalists, and of course consumers and clients, all are going to need to work together to pull through the deep tech solutions that our sector needs. And that's going to take longer, so there's no time to lose. We need to get cracking now. Third, our sector is really rather used to building new things rather than reusing what we've already got. But particularly with the rise of embodied carbon, we're going to need to treasure and preserve and reuse and refurbish what we already have compared to just thinking about greenfield and new build. Again, digital technologies have a great opportunity here. So, for example, in refurbishing and reusing existing buildings, a critical task is to understand their structural state. What's their state of repair? How have they deteriorated or otherwise over the 40 or 50 or 60 years of their design life? Digital tools, structural modelling, new forms of data, new forms of machine learning allow us to understand that in a way we weren't able to do previously. And that allows us to keep and reuse structures and buildings that otherwise we might have just written off. Likewise, when looking at the lifespan of a complex asset like a, a long span bridge, we can again use the combination of structural engineering, data insights and advanced simulations to properly understand how that infrastructure is performing and how it can be repaired and improved to last another 20 and 30 years. And that's an, an example that we Arab have done on a, on a bridge, for example, in the Netherlands. And even for more recent assets like offshore wind, the same issues. How can we extend the life of what's already there? How can we optimise the maintenance of that asset and the operation of that asset? We can use machine learning, data and digital and insights to provide fresh understanding about how that can be done and how we can prolong the economic life of existing assets. Finally, though, so much change in our world is now being driven by public policy, by commitments that are being made internationally, regionally and nationally towards climate change, 
towards climate resilience, towards nature plus, and other areas as well, these are the things that are driving change in our sector, whether it's the EU Green Deal or the American Inflation Reduction Act or the Chinese commitment to peak emissions in 2030 and reduce, or India's commitment to be net zero over the next decades. These are the commitments, the policies that are shaping our sector and providing the dynamic for change in our sector. But that means we're going to need to get better at working with governments, understanding governments, collaborating with public agencies and public policy to achieve the kind of changes we want to see. So the good news is that we have some fantastic digital technologies that we can use and deploy in our sector. The good news is that we know already they're helping us head towards net zero, improve climate resilience, get to nature plus, and provide services at scale for the population in the way we need. But there are challenges. We've barely started. We need to take time to develop the kinds of deep tech solutions that are, that are needed. We're going to need to increasingly focus on what we've already got rather than what we need to build. And we as a sector are going to need to get ever better and, more, and work ever more closely with decision makers and public policy agencies. But if we do all of that, the opportunity is very significant. And whether it's harnessing data in the built environment, whether accelerating urban innovation, whether it's promoting climate resilience, whether it's moving towards net zero and a nature positive future, or whether it's designing and delivering the future transportation, all the topics for our sessions today, there is an enormous opportunity to harness digital to tackle the world's needs. Thank you, and I hope the day is a wonderful one. I think it's a fantastic overview of the range of opportunity uh, in front of us. And we're going to explore that in a bit more detail now with a number of presentations um, and a discussion from, from key clients and collaborators. And I'm really excited to kick off with our first uh, presentation, which is remote, um, bringing together three collaborators. Um, Esteban Munoz, who uh, is part of UNEP, the U United Nations Environment Program based in Paris. Um, he uh, has a PhD in economics um, and is an architect and urban planner. Um, alongside Esteban, we have Raquel um, Vargas, who works in Mexico City for SEDMA, the environmental agency for Mexico City. Um, these two organizations have been working together with Arup on um, enabling nature based solutions for our cities. So, if I could uh, see if we can connect, hopefully, the technology is working. Good morning in Mexico. Can we hand over? Nervous moments. Can you hear us uh, on the line? Raquel? Uh, hi. Yeah. Hi, Raquel. Yeah, I'm over, ready. Welcome, welcome. <laughs> uh, over to you. Thanks. Good evening, everyone. My name is Raquel Vargas. And I have the pleasure to share with you the most relevant points of the project that we call it City Urban Garden Systems. I really appreciate the invitation from Arup on this event. Okay, let me go very fast to the background. We had three main actors with, the, with big coincidences. The UNEP City's unit office, designing green and thriving neighborhoods with nature-based solutions, Arup working with the idea of neighborhoods as a center point for developing sustainable cities. And the Environment Agency of Mexico City, we were working with bottom-up solutions promoting the creation of pollinating and urban gardens as nature-based solutions to revegetate the city and create resilience. Then when we had the, the approach with Arup, we decided to work together and the integration of an urban garden systems for Mexico City. Another actors were adding to the project as Eco City Builders, which is located in the United States, then uh, Eco Politicas and Tallero de Solaris that help us to, to get the ground data collected and also to, to design the strategy to get the, the, our urban, urban garden system. Once we had the team,
this picture also uh, help us to to uh, visualize uh, the organization that we we wanted. Can we move to the next slide? Okay, the challenge. We were very ambitious from the beginning. Uh, we needed first to know how many urban gardens exist in Mexico City, and then mapping them. Um, Aru proposed to use satellite tools to identify existing green space in Mexico City with potential to create more urban gardens. As you can see, uh, we the challenge was very ambitious with uh, 10 goals, but uh, we, uh, as our well, main, main objective with Aru was um, to, to identify the, the potentials to create more urban gardens, to, to make a, um, an analysis. And this analysis was very interesting. The proposal was a very complex analysis, qualitative and quantitative, of the potential of nature-based solutions to address the triple crisis of biodiversity provide an estimate of the potential impact Um, and then urban gardens. Uh, let me just uh, um, tell you that the, the ground data collected was, uh, we, we found at that moment a little more than 100 urban gardens. And The next slide, please. Ra Raquel, I'm, I'm afraid. Oh, we're, okay. Raquel, I'm afraid we're having yes. some technology difficulties. It's always the risk with a digital event is that the uh, the technology isn't on your side. Um, okay. let, let's just see briefly whether you can. Okay. Let me go to the next slide, please. No worries. Sorry, Raquel. I think we're going to have to um, we're going to have to pause there. I'm afraid we're, we're really Our struggling. Service. Okay. We're really struggling to hear you at this yes. end. Let's just uh, let me just check quickly. Esteban, can I see if your line's any better? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, is it, is no it a problem worries. just with the connection from Raquel? Because I, 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 can, it, I can understand it, well. Yeah, no, I, th I think it is. Esteban, could you just quickly um, sort of take over and summarize the last couple of slides? I'm really sorry. Um, we didn't have these issues in the tech earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No worries. No worries. I'll, I'll go through the through the rest yeah, of the, yeah, sure. the slides. Yeah, um, is, it, is it a problem? Um, rather quickly. Um, so basically, after after doing the ground up um, data collection, um, so we had um, 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 two uh, approaches. One that we will collect the data from the ground up, and then Arup was uh, coming from uh, with the with their uh, terrain tool from the top down, trying to um, map, identify existing uh, urban gardens and more importantly uh, try to create the potential that uh, that the city has to increase the this network of uh, urban gardens um so basically we identify then here three different type of urban gardens that work very differently that emerge in very different uh, situations so we have the small scale urban gardens which that's basically the uh, backyard uh, urban garden then we have the medium medium scale urban gardens, which is a little bit uh, bigger, has uh, offers more infrastructure to the population. And then we have the large scale urban garden that are closer um, to an agricultural um, um, company or enterprise. Um, so so um, uh, as you can see, very different uh, uh, type of urban garden that require a different approach. Um, at the end, with the terrain tool, we managed to to present um, basically the the potential. This is the app, the the apps, uh, 
just of a, a small part of the city. We did manage to do it for the whole city. We would just uh, pilot it in, the, in, a, in a smaller area of the city. And um, the surprise here was that the potential for urban gardens identified by the Toronto were very, very large, right? So there is a lot of uh, potential to increase the urban gardens. Then, of course, one of the, um, um, the missing components that we still have in the approach is that the terrain tool analyzes just the physical component of this potential. It doesn't include social demographic characteristics, social cultural uh, characteristics uh, of the cities that this needs to be uh, done on the, on, the, on the ground up. Um, nonetheless, we see a fantastic um, uh, potential collaboration between these two approaches. So an approach that is uh, uh, coming from big data, from satellite data, analyzing that, and then other approach coming from, from the, the ground up. So we were happy actually with these uh, synergies between these, these, these two approaches. Um, then uh, basically the, how we end up the, um, the project is trying to figure out the economic benefits of these urban gardens. Of course, there are uh, the benefits of local food production, uh, direct carbon sequestration, air pollution, uh, avoiding flooding, which is very important for the city. Um, very interesting, the heat-related impacts that the, these gardens could have in the city, the benefits of, this, of these urban gardens. And uh, through the bottom-up data collection, what we identified is that many of these urban gardens are emerging in areas uh, that are uh, uh, very dense with little uh, green areas. So, so these urban gardens emerge as a, as a result of this, uh, and we are attributing this to the heat island um, effect. Um, and with that, uh, I, I'll thank you everyone for listening. Apologize for the technical uh, difficulties. Uh, over, over to you. Thank right. you. Uh, Raquel, Esteban, thank you both very much and, and apologies for the, for the difficulty there. I think a really amazing example of the combination uh, of, of cutting edge technology and the satellite imagery that Will mentioned as one of his six sort of driving uh, capabilities um, and international collaboration. So, so brilliant to see. Um, thank you both for joining us um, and uh, we look forward to an ongoing collaboration with you both. Okay. So we're now in the room and um, so hopefully that makes the technology uh, a little bit more straightforward from here, but you, you never know. Um, so moving from Mexico, we're now coming back to the UK um, and we're going to look at decarbonizing the energy sector with digital twin technology. I can't think of anything really more pressing um, this winter in the UK than, than, than this. Um, and I'm delighted to introduce um, Carolina Torta, who is the head of digital transformation and innovation strategy at National Grid ESO. Um, as I understand it, you're also a creator, sponsor, and the, and the current program director for the whole energy system. In, interim. Interim. Okay, you're very modest as well. Um, uh, now called the, uh, the virtual energy system. So welcome to Arup. Delighted to have you. I'd also like to, to welcome uh, to the stage Simon Evans, who is Arup's digital energy leader. Over to both of you. Thank you. Great, thank you. So first, let me see if we get to our slide. Okay, so National Grid Electricity System Operator, about to become the, I don't know, definitely not National Grid, but the future system operator. What do we do? So we are in charge pretty much of the electricity system in Great Britain, meaning we're in charge of that minute by minute, second by second balancing of supply and demand, making sure that you always get electricity in your houses. The challenge, as you know, is we are decarbonizing. And what does that mean? That means that pretty much all of our traditional sources of generation are changing from your smelly, noisy, big, um, you know, and CO2 emitting uh, generators to renewable energy, which is great, but that comes with a wealth of problems. So you can imagine the size of the challenge that we're trying to face here. Here we have some numbers uh, that to give you kind of the, the context of where we are. First of all, so we have promised that by 2025, we will achieve at least one hour of zero carbon operation in Great Britain. It may seem like that's easy, it's really not. Uh, you have to understand what zero carbon operation means and why that's so complicated. 
The reality is that by 2035, however, which is really very, very short time away, I felt like 2025 when we first started talking about it was like 10 years in the future. It's not. It's, it's next year, right? So it's in a year and a half or so. 2035 is just going to come just as quick. To do that, we have to, first of all, ensure that we have enough generation to cover all of that demand. And you'll also hear about some of the challenges coming from that later on. We have an expectation of about 78 gigawatts of offshore wind coming in by then. To give you an, an idea of the scale of that, today demand, peak demand in the United Kingdom is around 60 gigawatts, and you only get there like, you know, specific month of the year. To cover that and, you know, and how that's going to change in the next 10 years or so, we're going to need way more generation than what we have today. Traditionally, you've always measured the amount of generation exactly to the amount of demand that you needed. That's not what, that's not what the future is going to look like. We're also looking into um, provi uh, provisioning the United Kingdom with another 18 to 30 gigawatts to get us to 30 gigawatts of interconnector capacity also by 2035. That means to go against the grain, right? We're talking Brexit on the one hand and the other is like, connect us, give us some of your power. But that's definitely one of the things that without which uh, our future energy scenarios don't work. And finally, and this is after, you know, there's some initial analysis that we've seen and we looked at and we're gonna need in order to get here, we're going to need about 20 to 30 gigawatts worth of flexibility. That's a whole new word for us. Well, not for us in ESO, we've been looking at it now for about five to seven years, but in the energy industry, it's a relatively new word. What does exactly, what does it mean? It means that it's not so much about generation and uh, demand, it's about managing to meet those two and coming up with the right tools and resources in order to meet the both expectations. So how do you flex from one side or the other? How do you supply all those other quantities that we were blissfully uh, almost ignorant of up till now, um, such as voltage control, frequency regulation and whatnot, because it just came free with the generators we had up till now. That's not going to be the case of the future. So this is what we're trying to do. How are we going to do this? Well, clearly, uh, I think Ofgem has been referring to flexibility as uh, full chain flexibility. Why, why do they mean that, that and why do they use full chain? Essentially, they're saying that the flexibility, we should get it from everything in the grid. And it's true, right? So flexibility is not necessarily building a um, compensator on the grid. Flexibility comes from your electric cars connected at home. It comes from being able to flex perhaps one day even your teapots and make sure that it's available to the grid when it's needed. We've got a problem not just so much in meeting demand, but sometimes we have a problem in meeting generation. Because with all of that renewable coming in, it's absolutely inflexible. You can't really tell the wind to stop blowing now because we don't need it, right? So nobody's really heating their homes right now or, to, or the sun to start shining, mm -hmm. even though it's the United Kingdom. So we need to work in a way that uh, we can flex both things. And that means the man has to step up to generation, not just the other way around. To get to this integrated energy system, you need to start modeling. So this is the one thing that in my day job, so as head of innovation, I've been seeing more and more in the past few years, people are asking me for more models, better models. They didn't know how people use electric cars. When do they charge it? How do they drive that? We just assumed that people were using the electric cars the way that they would use their normal cars. It turns out that that's not the case because there's uh, such a case of range anxiety. So people work and behave differently when it comes to it. But it's also our behavior as consumers that is changing, right? We're becoming more responsible about our impact on the grid and our own consumption. So we need better models so that we can create better scenarios for the future. And in order to create those scenarios, what do we need? Well, we need to know things. I need to see them. And right now, I'm perfectly blind to more than half of what's going on in the grid. And for that, Simon. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Carolina. <laughs> so to have that visibility of the system behaviour in a very diverse and dispersed system, we fundamentally need data sharing. Now, what I mean by data sharing is that it's exchanging information between different parties you know, within the same organisation, across organisations, even, or even across sectors, in a secure and resilient way. And that data sharing isn't just about sending emails to each other, because that's useful, but that's not really going to get us there. It's about that machine-to-machine -machine integration of data sharing, that interoperability, if you will. And that data sharing, using that word interoperability, therefore fundamentally requires a common framework that's both social and technical in nature to facilitate interoperability. 
Now, when I say social technical, the technical side, things like modeling, taxonomies, even the physical hardware, is often what a lot of the focus is on. And that's important, but there's also a known solution. We know what to do there. The social side, things like policy, regulatory, legal, skills, is just as important, if not more important, and something we really need to do together with the technical in order to facilitate this interoperability, this sharing of data between different actors. Now, completing this circle even further, we could conclude that in order to achieve net zero, we fundamentally need this common social technical framework to facilitate interoperability. And if you agree with us, which I hope you do, then the solution is something I think you'll find pretty exciting. <laughs> that's the virtual energy system. So that's the concept, right? We need data from all across the industry. We need to know what's going on. And we need data to feed into our own digital twins, so our own models. And that's where the idea came from, right? It's ambitious, it's complicated. We need to create an ecosystem of connected digital twins across the system. So anything from your electric car, one day your own home will have a digital twin, all the way up to transmission networks and nuclear power plants and interconnectors and perhaps even Europe and know how it all works together so we can create more complex scenarios to help us and support us in optimizing our decision making in planning for network development and understanding how to best go about decarbonizing the system. So it's how it can all work together in concert to give you a solution. And that's when we came up and asked Arab for some help in the approach and how do we go about it. So now it's Simon. <laughs> so how do we deliver it? Well, a social technical approach, which is really a social technical change program. And it's completely focused on use cases, tangible use cases and outcomes for the benefit of society, the economy, and of course, the environment. Now, ESO and Arup, supported by the Energy Systems Catapult and Icebreaker One, have created the foundations of this framework, which we see, as I say, is social technical in nature, and has these 14 factors that are grouped by people, process, data, and technology. People, for example, the roles and responsibilities, or the governance framework that supports this, or indeed the alignment of the modeling taxonomies and standards that exist across the sector today, and of course the interoperable tech stack that exists to support all this. Now each of these factors we consider are needed in order to make the virtual energy system successful, but a couple of them, the first amongst equals, are the ones we're prioritizing first and developing at the moment together through a demonstrated project. Now all of this is being done through the mindset of collaborate on the rules, compete on the game. And what I mean by that is we're working together with industry to collaborate on the rules of what should or shouldn't be within this framework, what should be there, the attributes, etc. So once the rules are defined, the industry at large can then compete on those rules based on their own commercial interests and their strengths. But fundamentally, it's the same rules. And together, we will bring success. So we're very excited about this, working with ESO, Energy Systems Catapult and Icebreaker One, and we see there's a really significant impact this will have. What a double act. Fantastic. Uh, thank you. Um, and just a reminder for those of you online, you can post questions as, uh, as we go and we'll pick them up at the end. Uh, if you're in the room, you've got to remember them. Um, so brilliant. So from, from energy, uh, now we're going to move on to delivering nature positive solutions through markets and digital technology in the water sector. And I'm delighted to introduce Guy Thompson, who's the Group Sustainability Director for Wessex Water, um, who's passionate about leading through purpose. Fantastic to have you. Um, and he's going to be joined by Vicky Williams, who is Arab's digital water leader. Guy, Vicky, over to you. Thank you, Tom. Good evening, everybody. So we're here to discuss how digital can help accelerate action on nature recovery and, and net zero. Um, and, and reflecting on the presentation so far, we're living in a policy and regulatory climate where there is unstoppable momentum now towards the requirement to de decarbonise our economies. Um, as Will pointed out in his keynote presentation um, at the head of the session, um, there have been now um, uh, international uh, obligations and targets 
to cooperate on uh, the action required to drive uh, um, uh, uh, our economies to a net zero future. But the equivalent action investment required to uh, enable our, um, uh, our economies to address the um, parallel crisis in uh, nature um, is lagging well behind. And um, it is that opportunity and need um, that we addressed ourselves uh, to in this collaboration. In a UK context, the government has been signed up to a commitment to restore, to be the first generation to restore the environment um, uh, 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 within, within a generation uh, through a 25 environment plan it published um, uh, five years ago. But there are huge challenges still to address uh, to deliver that um, type of ambition. However, on the supply side, as this quote from that 25-year environment plan illustrates, there is an opportunity to incentivise uh, landowners and farmers to uh, integrate uh, nature recovery alongside other uh, land uses like agricultural production. And on the demand side, we know that businesses are keen to invest in a nature-positive future. So how can digital underpin a whole new business model to accelerate and address the need to recover our nature. We've historically treated environmental challenges as what economists would describe as an externality um, to be addressed through regulation and public funding. However, it's becoming very clear that the claim, climate and nature crises uh, can't be tackled through philanthropy and public funding alone. There is a massive finance gap uh, between what is needed to deliver our environmental improvement goals and what is available uh, to do so. For example, the Green Finance Institute has estimated that between £44 billion and £97 billion is needed over the next 10 years to meet the UK's nature-related outcomes. Public funding alone clearly won't bridge that gap. So the notion of catchment markets that Entrade has been building um, together in collaboration with Arab and other partners arose from a piece of work um, we, we, we led nationally in response to the COVID pandemic. We developed the idea of a series of landscape scale use cases to demonstrate how we could accelerate private investment in nature. And at the heart was the notion that the availability of private capital is not the barrier. What in fact is needed is to prove the revenue streams generated by the services, the environmental services delivered by nature cleaner water, increased biodiversity, the reduced greenhouse gas emissions that come from nature-based solutions and reduced flood risk, for example. If we can prove those revenue streams at an investment scale, there'll be a return on uh, the investment in, the, in, 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 that, um, in, in those solutions. So the catchment markets emerged as one mechanism to prove those revenue streams and accelerate nature's recovery. So in parallel, we're working at a national level to tackle the challenges that I've articulated in this slide, which largely sit at a regulatory and policy level. We set out on the ground to establish partnerships to test the concept in the real world and build out a use case to prove the market. Now, Entrade, um, which is a not-for-profit Wessex Water subsid subsidiary, which is creating high integrity online markets to, in, to accelerate the, uh, to generate the environmental services deliver, delivered by nature-based solutions, originated in a, uh, a pilot um, initiated by Wessex Water. So our roots lie in the UK water utility sector. Um, the way in which we uh, incentivise um, asset-based uh, companies like water, water, water companies, I think, lie at the heart of how we can um, establish and, and catalyse the paradigm shift um, I, I'd like to in, um, present to you this evening. Now, traditionally, the UK water utility sector has been obliged to deliver thousands of indi individual inputs to meet environmental regulation, largely delivering point source improvements in quite narrow uh, water quality targets at the expense of wider benefits, wider environmental benefits. Now, those asset based solutions in a world of climate change look increasingly unsustainable. They're carbon in and energy intensive, they're chemical intensive, and frankly, in the cost of living crisis we are living through, um, they are unsustainable financially too. They're driving up water bills in the middle of a, a cost of living crisis. So the sector has been innovating with the use of um, what, we, what we call catchment solutions by working with farmers and landowners around our sources and assets. And those, but those approaches traditionally have tended to focus on, again, on more narrow targets and therefore fail to incentivise the multiple environmental benefits that can be generated from integrated solutions on the ground. 
So we think the water sector is really well placed to lead the adoption of a place-based, outcome-based approach where companies receive outcomes at a catchment scale and focus on those outcomes that are controllable to them. And, and, and given the flexibility by regulators uh, to innovate, uh, to work out how the most cost-effective way is of delivering those outcomes. Now, we think markets can help facilitate that collaboration. So whilst policy and regulation catches up, we need use cases. We need regulatory sandboxes to pilot and learn from how market mechanisms can accelerate investment in nature recovery. And we need market infrastructure to build confidence, trust and transparency. Our contention is that markets can help establish prices for the full range of environmental services that will enable farmers to obtain an economic return from the use of their land to deliver nature recovery and to reduce the very high transaction costs in uh, what are currently very informal trading environments, lacking standardised rules and procedures. So in essence, the catchment market mechanism reduces the transaction costs uh, and introduces, by introducing the role of a market operator, and in, in this case it is Entrade playing that role, um, to work as a central counterparty between the two sides of the market, we're taking on some of the risk of project failure. The markets are making it easier, therefore, for farmers and landowners to earn money from nature-based projects on their land through clear and specified and well-enforced and monitored obligations. And the markets are also then making it easier for organisations to meet their environmental goals in a timely and cost-effective way by providing a trusted source of high-integrity environmental credits. And we're working with Arup, and this is my baton pass to Vicky, to develop a range of use cases for different geographies, project types and environmental services to prove the architecture in different market environments. So over to, to Vicky to describe how digital, digital comes into this equation. Thank you, Guy. I think Guy has mentioned uh, here in the last bit the importance of the word um, integrity. And my argument to you today is in order to achieve that and to order to achieve nature-based solutions at scale, we need digital and we need digital tools to deliver that because we have to create trust, uh, deliver transparent markets and actually show that they're efficient. So in order to do that, then we have to satisfy these three conditions to deliver market requirements. Um, they have to be well designed. Um, that's from the bottom up. We have to put in all the service blueprints, and that's what Arup has been creating with Entrade, and develop that institutional architecture. And that's for both buyers and sellers, so they both have trust in the market. It has to be clearly governed, and it has to allow that there's appropriate standards underpinned by data that satisfies regulators and governments that actually we can deliver those nature-based outcomes. And finally, they need to be transparently operated so that we can see there's equity across the markets and it will allow, allow us then to track, attract that private and public investment that we so badly need. So what have we been doing in terms of the role of digital and data? So what do we need to do? So for instance, in the first place, we need to have access to that open data. We have to measure the baseline condition of the land that we're looking at to say what are the likely improvements that we could get there. Earth observation technology is allowing us to then see how we can monitor effectiveness and we can see how land use changes over time. And we need open software to allow automation of processes. And one of the examples of that is the algorithm that we do to do the market settlement process within the market. And finally, we need to be able to put in models that we can show that we can see that that impact has taken place and we can analyze that over time. So what do we have already and where are we going? Um, we have got a very exciting range of projects um, that we have been developing. Um, one of the most advanced ones is the Bristol Avon catchment um, that's been open now to market to both buyers and sellers and is going ahead. And then these other markets that we've developed and that's for around um, nutrient uh, neutrality uh, that is allowing nitrogen and phosphorus uh, to be traded between buyers and sellers. 
But re more recently, we've been developing the underlying background of how you deliver um, a whole pilot for a whole country in the respect of Wales. And we're just due to go hopefully into pilot with Welsh government and Welsh water. But more recently, we have got, we've just landed quite recently a market around looking at sustainable drainage and how we can manage flooding for the Greater London Authority. And as you can see, we've started to develop a range of tools um, that allows us to look at the environmental assessment and support Entrade also through the market mechanisms and to deliver that so that we can get a full um, um, nature-based solutions in, in the long run. Now, this evolves us to having to have a very long-term approach in that. We need a technology roadmap, which we're in development of, and we will be developing those features, hopefully, over the next three years to develop lots of these environmental integrity markets. Thank you. Well done. Fantastic. Thank you. So we started with energy. We've just done water. We're now going to do energy in the water. Um, and so I'm, I'm delighted to introduce uh, Will Apps, who's the head of Mi marine development at the Crown Estate, um, who's going to be joined by Becky Drake, who is leading offshore wind uh, digital solutions for Arup. And they're going to be talking about how to scale offshore wind and support the UK's energy transition. Over to you. Um, good evening. A, a real pleasure to be with you. And um, we, we're accelerating towards a, an exciting Q&A. So we'll, 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 we'll get you there as soon as you can. Um, just a bit quick about the Crown Estate. I, I have the privilege to work on the seabed uh, in the UK. So as the Crown Estate, we, we work the seabed um, as, as a service to the nation. We look to see what we can drive in terms of prosperity in that regard, and we measure that prosperity in the context of financial, environmental, and social value. And what the seabed provides, when you look off the beach, as I do sometimes as I'm getting with my boat on the south coast, it looks a very quiet, place lovely sort of surface i now actually see the odd wind turbine popping up so it's superb we can see some clean energy but what the seabed provides in terms of the ecological services for the nation and what it does for infrastructure is completely overlooked and what becky will talk to you in a minute is is a, an ability for us to start to challenge ourselves to understand how those pressures come net zero is not only a gift to us in terms of a, a, a of, a, of a single horizon for us to really drive what we mean to do in society as you would all be probably working on now, what it is also a gift to is an ability to convene around a destination. And tools like we're talking about today and the tools we'll talk about in a minute that Arab has helped us with is providing us a powerful tool to convene to make micro and macro decisions in terms of how the seabed will be used. 95% of the data we keep talking about, and it's, it probably needs a bit of a, surge, a, a charge, goes through cables on the seabed. So you, you, when you think about satellite technology and everything else, so, so the infrastructure requirements on telecoms, the infrastructure requirements on food, the embedded carbon sink of the seabed, all of those things need to be start to be juggled around in terms of how we're going to get to a world where we build more. So we've just heard about the energy system, 78 gigawatts in, in plan, the sort of deployment curve we have on offshore wind gets us around to about 130 gigawatts. So when we think about the scenarios that Becky's going to talk to in a minute, truly getting to net zero, being an exporter of power, because the UK is long on seabed opportunity, the rest of Europe is actually in short, so we have an ability to really help our neighbours in this, in this challenge, is really key. But, but linking the presentations, we've also got to do that in the context of the marine environment is in a very poor state. And so as we build out this huge amount of infrastructure, we've got to really start to balance the, the knowledge and evidence to, cr to drive decision making. And so convening around decision making is the theme I'm going to leave you with. And I'll come back at the end when Becky's talked to you about how we can get to a tool on this point. Thank you, Will. So we've got a quick slide here to just kind of frame the challenge and the context of what the Crown Estate brought to us as the research questions that we were going to look at for the UK offshore wind out to 2050. And I always like to set the scene with the fact that we have currently under 20 gigawatts of offshore wind in UK waters. Um, that is actually a huge achievement and it is significant in the global market and the context. But out to 2050, we're looking at up to 130 to 140 
gigawatts of offshore wind. So that's a massive step change to support us reaching net zero in the whole energy system. Balance with that, as Will has kind of introduced there in the frame, we've got all these complex interactions of the UK seas waters in terms of the environmental considerations and designations and in terms of all of the other physical infrastructure and marine economic activities that we need to balance. Also within this and the other aspect that we need to consider is kind of the rising cost of energy at the moment is kind of front and centre of all of our minds. Offshore wind has gone through a significant journey over the last couple of decades in the European and UK markets to significantly reduce the cost of energy. We need to continue to balance producing electricity from offshore wind at a low cost with making sure that we are balancing those complex interactions of the UK seas. So on to the way we came about tackling this and the solution. So for us, this is very much a apt example of where bringing together vast quantities of data, different data sets, digitizing some of those data sets that might not have been digitized before, and then modeling that in a digitalization process so that we come up with a solution that's incredibly data driven and is also very efficient in our ability to be able to run, I've said multiple scenarios on the slides, but we're talking about hundreds of scenarios. I think well, we probably did about 800 scenarios for this piece of work in a very quick time frame. So we're really taking a process that has existed manually and with a huge amount of stakeholder engagement in the past to understand that balance and those complex interactions in the UK seas and turn that into a digital enabled process to really allow us to run huge numbers of scenarios to broad a deep evidence base to support future decision making. So we came up with a digital solution which we have called SCALE and what that does is it brings together the ability to assess your levelized cost of energy with considering your spatial considerations and to run a significant number of scenarios around your treatment and consideration of those geospatial scenarios. And crucially, what we do is we then bring those two aspects together. So in the past, that those have been considered in parallel, but that's been a much more manual process. And what SCALE does is it optimizes for both of those aspects together. So you can start to build an understanding of where in UK waters is most optimal from a cost of energy perspective, but also balanced and most optimal from a least interaction with your other seabed activities. Um, on the right gives an example of all of the many kind of system sensitivities and geospatial scenarios that we looked at to develop this evidence base to support future decision making. Um, onto this slide and what we delivered. So SCALE is the digital model, model and modeling capability that sits behind what's showing on screen at the moment. This is a website, I think the video is playing, but there we go. Um, so you've got the QR code there. I would encourage you to go and explore this. It provides a very interactive visualization experience of the output from SCALE and the modeling work. This is futureoffshorewindscenarios.co.uk. Um, provided for and hosted by the Crown Estate on behalf of the Crown Estate UK government department that was Bayes up to a few weeks ago and Crown Estate Scotland. Um, and this provides kind of the public, publicly viewable visualisation of many different permutations that we looked at to support understanding future use of the seas out to 2050 and driving forward that low cost net zero electricity um, provision in offshore wind and balancing with all these other different components there but my one request with providing a qr code up on screen is that you take a snapshot of it and then look at it after the panel discussion <laughs> um, so with that in terms of what we delivered i'm going to hand back to will to give his thoughts on what we delivered and to explain a little bit about the next steps and how this is part of and one solution as part of the whole ecosystem of the energy system and the marine environment going forwards thanks will thanks becky so so not to 
play down the importance of what we've just looked at and what this bottled is, this was, from our point of view, the dress rehearsal. It was a real proof of concept of the decisions. Every single line that Becky had up just now that mapped those scenarios, in the end, is a decision that someone might need to take. Now, some of those decisions are pretty big. In fact, they probably have to be taken by government. If you're going to completely protect the environment, and, and there is a scenario that pushes all the wind farms to the outer edge of the UK continental shelf, that's a pretty expensive energy system. And so the ability to take decisions on the basis of what is going to be the cost to consumer, there's a huge amount of work we need to do with our colleagues at ESO. We signed a statement of intent with them over a year ago that when we start to look at this, at the moment we haven't got Carolina's integrated energy system into this. Where the wind needs the grid and where does the grid need the, grid need the wind is part of an iterative process that we will be going through Carolina's teams in the ESO and in the future system operator to make sure that we're creating decisions as an integrated model but the C environment as we've talked about is we've got to make some really important policy decisions around what do we do in terms of set aside for environment what do we do in terms of the, the, the multiple infrastructure that I talked to earlier so that we're making decisions on what is actually quite an urgent and quite a well functioning position on offshore wind we've done great work to date to get to the point of being the world's we were the world leading china have just overtaken so the second leading market in the world for offshore wind but the the ability to deliver as we've done in the past will not get us to the future cliche but it is we've done a load of work at the moment where we've enabled projects to be borne out on a less busy sea space so 13 gigawatts is operating right now so to get to 130 we've got to find the space for this and we've got to get to the point where it's consented. We've got to get to the point where it's connected to the grid. And dealing with those issues up front so that they are not in the world of pro uh, investors on the seabed trying to get their consents and get their grid connections, answering those questions early, systematically, and allowing the, allowing the pace of deployment to keep up is going to be really critical. And a little bit of a, a, little bit of a case study is what we're doing on the Celtic Seas at the moment, the, the next leasing round. And the HND that Carolina talked to, in the past our customers would take a plot of seabed and they'd go off and do the development activity. It would take them seven years to the point of probably getting consent, another two years to get financial close, another four years to build. We can't afford that time frame. And what we're doing with the Celtic Sea is the four gigawatts of opportunity we're going to provide to the market once we've done the tender is already in the design contemplation of holistic network design. So working together is really key but working that in the context of balancing environments and finding more space for another 60 gigawatts is, is requires us to think in this way and convene and, and, and highlight those decisions we need to take collectively so on that note we stop great so Thank you, Will and Becky. And if I could just ask all three of our clients and collaborators to, to make their way to the front. Uh, and uh, Will has sort of managed this incredible trick of being on the screen earlier and sort of magically in the room. So uh, Physical and digital, isn't that uh, <laughs> one of the themes? Brilliant, thanks very much for, for joining me. I think, I think the, world, uh, the term world leading is very much overused, including in, this, in the UK, obviously. But I think those are genuinely world leading examples and case studies of, of developing digital and for global impact. You know, whether it is decarbonizing the energy grid, or whether it is scaling up nature recovery, or whether it is supporting you know, massive deployment of offshore wind in the context of trying to treasure and preserve and improve our marine environment. You know, all, all issues that the whole world is, is facing. It's often said though that successful innovation is 10% inspiration and 90% perspiration. And so as people who are leading you know, examples of successful innovation using digital, I want to my, my first question was, you know, what have been the principal obstacles that you've faced and how did you overcome them? And I'll ask a couple of panelists to mention that and then we'll move, we'll move on. Carolina, I wanted to ask you that question first. You know, what's been the biggest challenges you've faced how, and how have, you managed to, how have you managed to get things underway? Right, so my answer to this is always people. So the technology is never the problem. You find that there's always someone smart enough somewhere that's come up with the best solution. Uh, it's cheap, it's easy to use, um, it's convenient. 
the problem is getting people on board. So in the case of digital, you know, the energy industry in particular is one of the slowest changing um, industries there are, right? We still have on the grid transformers from the 1960s and they work just fine. Um, my previous industry, which was the aerospace one, has to much move much faster. So that's why one of the biggest hurdles has been trying to convince people that you need to change, even when things can still go on a little bit longer the way they are. So it's bringing them on board and showing them the value in the change. I'm, I'm tempted to make the pun about the aerospace naturally would move faster, but I won't, get, I won't get there, nor obviously about the fantastically named William Apps for digital conversation. But anyway, no, I said it. W w what's, your, what's your sort of thoughts about that? Is it, is it like, for like Carolina, is it people that are, that are the big thing to persuade and change? What, what, have, what, have, what have you faced in trying to take it forward in your area? I think that's right. And it, and it, are we on? And so, um, yes, people, but I'll, I'll elaborate in terms of kind of the roles. So when you look at the offshore space, um, there, is a lot, there are a lot of agencies and actors have a, a role to play, and, and not least of which was the Energy Department, Crown Estate Scotland, who look after the seabed, and we do the bit in England, Wales, and Northern Ireland. So you're already in a world where um, you're trying to convene across different geographies, and, and that's interesting, and different roles. So not only is it about people, but it's about the agencies that come together to make quite, quite, quite challenging decisions collectively, which is why this is so powerful, to agree to convene around a, 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 an approach, a framework, and a lot of the words you heard out here, a transparency of that is really key. The, one of the big things we were concerned about was actually the reaction we might get from Put It Up, because we hadn't, this is why I call it the dress rehearsal, we haven't yet gone through and talk to the fishing industry. We haven't yet talked to the environmental groups. We haven't yet talked to all of the people who have a role and a, 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 a jeopardy around some of those decisions we were talking about. And what, what was great was we actually got a, an excellent reaction from that project, and one where we were really concerned about the release of what looks like us or, ba or Bayes or, or, or Crown State sort of taking those decisions, and we weren't. We were just providing the basis to indicate the sorts of challenges we we're going to face in building this out. One of the other benefits we've got to is it looks possible. <laughs> so having something that, that, that gives you a pitch to say this is possible to get there and providing that destination and a, and a framework of approach to it, um, we find ourselves most of the time managing words rather than space. And in the world where you start to really put this about managing space and, and making it real in that way, just completely changes the conversation. So, um, so both the challenge and the solution. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that I think that that gets to one of the points I think that um, uh, was made in the in the digital twin presentation that that all digital change is usually socio-technical, and in some ways, uh, Carolina, as you were saying, the 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 easy bit is the digital bit or the technical bit. There's always somebody smart enough or a group of people. The challenging bit is perhaps bringing people with you and and persuading. And that leads to my next question, Guy, for you, which is that. Um, we need to do all of that. We need, we need to be getting the right solutions in place, but also doing the job of persuasion and alignment and, and so on, at the same time as wanting to move at pace, you know, in, in terms of what you're trying to do, you know, galvanise the approach to nature-based um, recovery at a time where we're massively nature-depleted and we're facing, you know, a sixth extinction. So how do you balance those things? How do you balance the need to bring people with you with the, the desire to move at pace in what are very, very complicated groups of stakeholders, interest groups, landowners, you know, how do, how do, you, how do you manage that yourself? How, how are you making progress in that environment? Okay, yeah, I'm sort of echoes the answer to the last question. Was it 10% inspiration, 90% perspiration? Uh, maybe that's 5% I'd, I'd argue with that ratio <laughs> some days, yeah. It feels like there's a heck of a lot of perspiration going on in, 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 in the world of catch markets, but, um, yeah, you're absolutely right. The, 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 the markets we're creating involve um, a range of different actors, uh, water companies, farmers, environmental regulators, housing developers, local authorities with diverse needs. And we're creating markets where we're bringing together multiple suppliers and multiple buyers, delivering multiple environmental services in different environmental, in different geographies, right? So there's a few moving parts in there. 
Um, and um, digital fundamentally underpins how we're um, uh, reconciling that and, and building confidence in the uh, uh, in, in the, the outcomes we're delivering. Um, so uh, and 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 our, and and. and our blocker here is the deep distrust of markets in delivering environmental outcomes. Uh, founded on the fears of greenwash and uh, the well-publicised market failures in voluntary carbon and biodiversity offsetting context. So use cases is going, is, 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 are going to be key to um, addressing those. But in the meantime, demonstrating through the application of digital um, tools to quantifying uh, the environmental benefits in the real world. So, for example, the work we've done with Arup has got us to uh, uh, developing a, uh, a standard, a standardised methodology for quantifying the nutrient reduction delivered by uh, nature-based pro projects like wetlands and woodlands. Uh, and we've also, with the support of Arup, built credit registries to build trust and transparency yeah. around the credits and enable regulators to trace them from cradle to grave. So in some ways using using digital and data for transparency builds confidence and allows you to move more quickly than other ways of doing business. Okay. Correct. Now the theme of this event is digital horizons, not sort of not digital fear. Um, and so I wanted to kind of look forward a little bit and ask and ask each of you um, what your personal vision was for the biggest opportunity that you see of deploying of digital and data in the areas that you're you're working on. And, and I know your organisations may have a view of that, but I'm just really interested in, in your views as senior people leading change in each of your areas. So Carolina, can I turn to you first again on that one? What's the, what's the sort of thing that you're looking forward to? What's the biggest opportunity that you see in, in the area of, that you work in? So I think the best quote I ever heard on this was from someone in national control who I think randomly, I don't even remember what we were talking about, but he said that essentially the way that the control room works, we it's the control room engineers that really have to take anything into account, everything that is happening. They have to have a memory of what's happening and then they enter the dispatch decision on this machine and that's how it goes through. So he essentially said all the uncertainty is managed by us. And the tool, the, I wouldn't call it digital, but the, I, the, the tool, the computer, gets the certain solution. We got to flip that, right? So as the energy system becomes so complicated and you know, we start taking into account all these different factors and it starts accumulating, you're asking essentially control room engineers or you're asking the people in my company, my colleagues, to just think the unthinkable, to start building all these scenarios, you can't. You can't capture all of that. So similarly, again, thinking about the aerospace uh, industry, a pilot, as flying the airplane became more and more complex, and especially if you're looking at you know, spaceships or the shuttle and so on, less had to be on the pilot, more had to be managed and controlled by the automated pilot or by more sophisticated systems. So to me, the end vision is I need to make life an ESO or you know, and my colleagues easier. And I need to ensure that it's not a human mistake or distraction or something that you miss, which is absolutely normal, that you know, causes whatever problem. I gotta be able to support our operations with digital tools, new advanced tools. Fantastic, thank you. Guy, what's your response to that? The, the, the sort of big vision, the big opportunity that you see going it's, a, it's nothing short of a total paradigm shift in how we think about um, uh, the value of nature and monetize the services nature provides to us um, economically. Um, in, in the nature world and indeed in the water utility world, if I could be um, a bit controversial, I think we still exist in, a, in an analog paradigm. There's just an, just such an enormous opportunity here to move, um, to leverage digital services, to move, um, uh, to accelerate uh, investment in environmental improvement. So, so my vision is the use of digital tools, models, and technologies to enable us to deliver clean energy, water quality improvements, nature recovery, and drive that investment into 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 environmental improvement. That requires ultimately government and regulators to approve and accredit the use of platforms and tools that could be consistently applied in different geographies. And if I might say, there's, a, there's an opportunity here. I, I'm unashamedly UK-centric in this thinking in the sense that we have 
I think, a well-founded reputation for the best established um, uh, regulatory models and codes of uh, practice uh, for corporate governance. Why, in a world where we now freed from the shackles of EU regulation, if you want to use that type of um, uh, rhetoric, we, we have the flexibility to deliver in that post-Brexit environment a different way of um, driving environmental improvement. Um, why would we not take the opportunity to establish the UK, uh, UK advantage here in exporting digital services, environmental services in AI, project development, monitoring and enforcement, and, and, and export that to the rest of the world? Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Let me move on to my next question, because I think, well, you've already given us quite a strong sense of, of, of your vision. But let me let me ask you the ne next question, which is in, in all of these areas, you've been quite complimentary about the work that Arab's done for you. Know, for you but you're speaking now to an online audience. And my, my question to you guys is, um, what more do you want from the likes of Arab or others to help you meet that vision, to help you meet that plan, to help you deliver those opportunities? What, what should we be doing more of? How should we be meeting more of what you need going, going forward? Well, let, let me ask you to, to sort of lay down the gauntlet to us about what more we can be doing, how better we can help. Yeah, I think it, it's, it's, so there's, so there is a huge volume of work to be done. And so what we've got to take out of this tool, there's a, everything we've just talked about is an environmental urgency and there's, an, and there's also a, a net zero stroke energy emergency. So the ability to use these to really home in on what next in terms of the roadmap to get to X and Y. And what I mean by that is we've got a, we've got a separate program which we set up before we had the ability to give us like this sort of vision we've talked to here where we were investing in what we call the data gaps. So one example is we're going to be working with, 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 with the navigation agencies to think about how we're going to, how we should we organize the safe navigation of the seas when you've built 130 gigawatts of offshore wind and you've done some CCS reservoirs, et cetera. And, and really finding a pathway through to the destination is really key. In, in some regards, the solution to map 2030 is pretty easy, but, there's a, but you're having to do it on a whole basis of, of uncertainty and not really knowing whether either 130 gigawatts of offshore wind is the right answer. The energy system might turn around and say, well, we get to 95 and we're done because we can do the rest elsewhere. But that shouldn't stop us having the tool that's providing the scenarios to plan around that because we need an ability to iterate. As we get that data on where safe navigation of the seas is going to be managed well and the equipment that will be on the vessels and the nav aids to do it all, we also need to iterate the firm plans we need for investment. And so I, we talked earlier, offshore wind, the next the leasing round we're doing is the wind farms that will be built connecting to, to, the, to, to the holistic network design in 2030s. So we have to give foresight to the investment case on huge, huge cast forwards on firm investable propositions to get us on track to net zero in terms of the investments that's done. Meanwhile, we've got to deal with all the uncertainty of what it actually means to what we would actually want to put on the ground in 2040. So, take the tools, have the ability to scenarize, but also have the ability to home in on the, the data and the focus we need to be able to continue to move at pace with certainty that far in front of us, but with the end game in mind. I, I, it's, it's a complicated picture, but I think the, the prioritization of effort will be needed if we're going to deliver at pace. And, and you need partners who understand that. Yeah, so get, the transparency that, of that. And, and, and want to innovate and put some skin in the game around it and so on. C Caroline, let me ask you, you the same. I, I've, I've sat roughly on your side of the fence and I've probably thrown, thrown a few rocks at the supply chain that claims it's really innovative and isn't innovative enough or doesn't really understand the world that you work in, the choices you face, some of the, some of the kind of pressures that you, you sit under. What, what more can the likes of Arab do to help you achieve this big transformation that you're trying to achieve on behalf of the nation? So, interesting enough, I was taking some notes earlier, and I think what you're doing, these kind of events, is exactly the kind of stuff that we're looking for. The problem with doing innovation in, in our field, or any field in general, is that you end up thinking in a silo. So, you end up thinking that what's going to solve a energy problem is an energy solution. And you're not aware of everything else that is going on 
around your how other industries are moving and changing, right? So some of the slides that you showed earlier in, in, in the recorded uh, intro had some very interesting ideas. So I was looking at generative, that is something I that I'd like to discuss, so how AI can support us in developing the network, right? So how it can find patterns and things, the same things that we're doing in machine learning, um, and how we can use that to start doing holistic design of gas, electricity, and uh, hydrogen for the future. Uh, or looking at how, you know, like the uh, sensor data, is there anything else that we can look at and, and get inspiration? Now, aside from the details of it, is that exposure? Because as a consultancy or in general, your business, I'm not your only customer, right? So you're not just looking, you, you've got an energy practice, but you've got a water practice, you've got a digital practice, you've got a finance practice. So you're, you're sitting and it's your conversations, your chats around you know, the water cooler, as we used to be at least back <laughs> in the day, uh, are the ones that really bring that innovation to fore. That's where you say, oh my god, that's brilliant. You know what, I've got a customer that is trying to solve this other problem, and this would work really well for them. I am dying for that kind of stuff, because right now, we don't know where to get it, because the people that come to us only come to us with their stuff, and it's same old. Yes, I know about this. Maybe you're cheaper than them, but I'm seeing the same stuff. Innovation works by exposure. That's why open innovation, it's such a big concept. You've got to be open. You've got to be open not just to new solutions, but other, other industries, right, and what they've come up with. Fantastic. That almost, cue, that almost perfectly cues up my final question for this bit before we go to audience Q&A which is, th this is this is intended to be a sharing and learning event. So I was going to ask you, what, what one thing do you think you've learned from the session today that you want to take into your own practice going forward? And I'm looking directly at Guy as the first respondent. Uh, well, I think it's about thinking l long term and, and, and breaking ourselves out of, uh, and, and in a water utility context, you know, we are... Uh, we, we are driven by this slavish five-year price control determination, um, and, and that's just just not driving an efficient way of um, uh, using uh, our shareholders and cu customers' money. Um, so thinking long term, and I'd echo what um, was just said about the the need to think about um, uh, in, a, in a more integrated way to tackle. Um, what, what tends to be very siloed approaches yeah. by big organizations to tackling these very complex uh, ch challenges. Thing, you know, language like systems thinking is, is, is easily thrown around, um, but I think big organizations like Arup are really well placed to support um, uh, innovative, like-minded partners to tackle partnerships in a more, um, more innovative and um, integrated way. Fantastic. Thank you, Guy. Will? Um, I had to check because I wrote it down, but it was, there was a phrase used by collaborate on the rules and then let the market play within the rules. And I think there's a really interesting one. The challenge I've talked to, there's an inevitable sort of philosophy that you get to a point of a more central mind in terms of government decisions on the trade-offs I talked to and so on. And, and that isn't necessarily the right answer. We know the market has so much to offer. And so I think the point on this is to find a way in which you don't stifle the innovation that we've been talking about, but find a way in which there's a framework within that can thrive and then allowing it to thrive. So, so I think there's a really interesting of, of collaborator on the rules. Fantastic, thank you. Carolina, final say. Yeah, so those are the two things that I have written uh, down that I really wanted, to, I'm sorry if I'm, I'm really concrete about this stuff, but I'm, I'm actually really interested in uh, generative design. So for uh, holistic network design, I think it will work really well with uh, Jules' uh, area and what he's trying to do. And then on the um, structural performance uh, digital twin, so the work that you're doing to see whether or not existing infrastructure can be uh, repurposed, because right now we're looking at gas uh, networks being able to withstand also hydrogen and what pressures and with what conditions, uh, and what needs to replace, what doesn't need. So there's always uh, areas in that, so specifically in those areas I'd like to follow up. Fantastic, thank you. Now we, we, um, we, we promised audience members um, a primary benefit of being able to ask a question, only a secondary benefit of drinks and nibbles afterwards. I <laughs> promise you that it's the panel that's the primary benefit. So let me open up to you know, Q&A from the floor. Who's gonna be courageous enough to pop the first question? Mark, you are definitely looking very pregnant with thought. <laughs> 
Oh, we've got a hand. I, I apologise, Mark. Yeah. Sorry, where was the hand? Hi, um, this is a question for Guy. Um, it's a question about the the way in which digital tools might allow um, what I think you're describing as sort of nature services trading, or yeah, how that uh, how a digital tool might allow you to leap over the problem that carbon trading has had. So you know, carbon trading has been constrained by low carbon prices. Do you see a way in which digital could overcome that? So I, mean, yeah, I think there's always a challenge when it comes to com uh, t taking a carbon market context and applying it to what are essentially local markets generating environmental services that um, uh, who's, for, for whose value is only um, can only be um, priced in a local context. So that would be the first thing to say because I think government um, and regulators tend to, uh, in thinking about these nature-based markets, take trading in a global commodity, which is carbon, and, and apply the same uh, principles. And I don't think that's always um, relevant um, and indeed appropriate. Uh, I think we'd say the role of digital uh, in these markets could be uh, twofold. One is to uh, support the, the efficiency with which these services are traded uh, and the ability to apply the market settlement mechanism uh, that uh, Vicky described earlier is an example of the, this. Um, we're using in this context a mechanism designed by a team of academics at the University of Exeter, independently designed, leveraging um, the work they've done to take the, um, the Shapley value and apply it to an environmental land management context. Um, and uh, if it works, it will incentivize the project suppliers to supply projects at cost uh, and generate a surplus in the market. So it's rewarding cooperation in the market and therefore eff effectively providing a bonus to the landowners cooperating in that market and a discount on the uh, prices that the buyers are paying for the credits. Um, so there's the, there's the transactions and the ease with which those transactions flow through the market, which is part of the equation. And the second part of it is about the long-term, these are long-term uh, contracts, right? So in, in, this, in, 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 one, in, in two of our use cases, uh, we are looking to enter into contracts with farmers land, land managers for 80 years and more. Uh, and therefore, the, the value of digital tools um, and platforms will be in how we monitor over, you know, a sig over a course of three generations uh, th those those um, uh, those contracts and ensure that and that we're monitoring, we're, we're quantifying and uh, monetizing the value of the environmental services being delivered over that type of duration. I don't know if that helps in relation to your ca your carbon point, but that's how we see these carbon uh, these catchment markets working. Well, yes, yeah, sure. I'll just make a very quick point. Um, what's being done terrestrially, we are decades behind in the marine environment in terms of the knowledge of what it means to have things like net gain and, and, and a lot of the stuff that you'd rely on in terms of the, fun the policy background to this is so immature. So the ability to take what Guy's talking about and, and accelerate what we would need to do to apply that offshore is, is remarkable and <laughs> exciting to see someone's dress rehearsal. But that learning can, oh. as you say, that learning can allow with digital to tools. You just yeah. it goes back to the point four about yeah. pace of pace of deployment of yeah. that would be, yeah. yeah, fantastic, really interesting. I mean, I think one of the points in there is that is that sometimes the innovations that are being proposed can risk coming up against the sort of barrier of regulatory certainty. So regulators, whether it's for offshore or onshore, in, or indeed from the likes of Ofgem, want to know with certainty that you're going to achieve something by a certain period. And you're saying, well, we're going to try and use a pricing mechanism or other sort of an innovation. And they're like, mm, well, we can't guarantee that's going to get us to X percent by 2020 or 20, sorry, um, 2025 or 2030. And that is also a, an element of that needs to be managed, yes. Can I, can I come back on that point briefly? Because I think you're absolutely spot on, Will. And it's about the... Uh, the, the part of the paradigm shift here is in, in about the type of regulation we envisage. This is about a pivot from the traditional form of regulation we see in this space, which is uh, which is ex, ex post to ex ante regulation, establishing enough of a, um, a bank of projects to be able to evolve and, and based on modelled outcomes, not measured outcomes. Measured outcomes, we don't have the time mm. to establish these projects and measure outcomes. We we've got to we've got to work on modelled outcomes, and obviously, and then and, and the work we're doing with Arup to then establish standards behind which we can then evolve those 
uh, evolve that, that that regulation and, and measure the, uh, the, the, the the outcomes being delivered by these projects Great. is going to be key. Thank you. Fantastic. I think we've got time for one more question. Mark, <laughs> <laughs> having been volunteered, <laughs> well, I look rather shocked. <laughs> So th first of all, thank you all, all three of you and, and the sort of Arab colleagues because uh, that was three amazing presentations that you managed to link together really well. But one sort of point that I noticed, which was quite at the human level, is um, sort of Caroline, you obviously talked about the people who make those decisions in the control room. Um, Will, you kind of talked about those groups that you need to engage, you know, groups of people from very diverse backgrounds in publishing a map and seeing what comes of it. Um, and Guy, you talked about obviously the market and buyers and sellers who by their nature on opposite sides. All of it seems to me that there's an enormous amount of persuasion that needs to happen, an enormous amount of trust you talked about. So in the kind of social media world where there's perhaps less and less trust in data and information and systems and messages that we hear these days, how do you think you go about building that trust? How do you go about persuading individual people who have very influential positions or mass numbers of people who you need to get on board with policies? Carolina, do you want to? <laughs> or oh, Will, you're, you're just a small. Yeah. <laughs> Carolina, you right. I am really bad at social uh, in general, and I, I'm going to include following some feedback I've gotten from my stakeholder uh, lead <laughs> over there. Even email, <laughs> I'm apparently not not very good at it. So, I'm. But I'm going to say that it is about the people and it is about the relationships you build with the people the one thing that has worked for me is competence right so you need to i, I talk about my colleagues if i'm going to convince my colleague i can't go there saying you know i've got the solution for you without knowing what the problem is right so you need to build competence you need to understand go i deep dive i go vertical so i started that I barely knew Kirchhoff laws when it came to electricity. And at this stage, I'm pretty much a power systems engineer. Like you have to know this kind of stuff, right? So you build the understanding, you know the history because it is extremely arrogant and it's very uh, unpleasant to have someone after you've been on the same business for 30 years that's been in it for 20 minutes telling you, I know how to solve your problem, right? That's not gonna fly. So you need to go there, you need to understand it, talk to them, get to know them, and then from there you can you can propose, have you thought about that? And understanding that what you bring is not better brains or more knowledge or understanding, what you bring is just a fresh mind, right? So that to me is the one thing that has worked. Fantastic, thank you. Yeah, I found myself thinking the word arrogance in my response, so you, you've covered it well. And I think there's also a bit of trust and, and so the decision taking, and I talked about the different roles that people take, you know, the ability to actually, you know, so, so when, we, when we've been in this past in terms of characterization of seabed of where we would put leasing, you're having to point to the point of, of yeah, that, that fishing means that much and, and that activity of safe navigation is worth that much and you produce a heat map and where's good to go. So, so the physical decision taking we keep coming back to, the trust in that is important. So, so you've got to get people on, on with in the program so that they don't feel there's an arrogance of whoever's trying to push that has got the answer. We don't, we don't have the answer as a Crown Estate in this in terms of what we're pushing through. What we do, we hope, is we've got an ability to be able to listen intelligently and apply it into a tool which then can come up with the answer. And, and, and then, therefore, there's a trust in the answer. So we have to be able to engage and we have to be able to build that trust that then the model is turning out the right answer and then we then we then we move forwards so yeah yeah i mean i've learned the hard way that just imploring people to buy me and my passion and my motivations because i just want to make a difference right and i just want to see nature um recover within my lifetime it doesn't doesn't cut through because inevitably people look at the problem you're trying to solve through their own particular lens um, and therefore it is just dogged determination to uh, apply a strategy in our case we've worked nationally and locally to develop use cases and that, that mirror our um, uh, policy uh, f f f solutions essentially nationally um, and, and, and then find to your point about people find the like minded people that can collaborate in, in, in a safe environment uh, and come together to de demonstrate how the, 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 the solution works in the real world yeah 
I think that is our time come to an end. So, Tom, over to you. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, that is the end of uh, our session. I'd just like to um, ask everyone to raise their, put their hands together and thank our panel. Will, Guy, Carolina, thank you so much. I think really interesting, both the, the combination of the presentations and the insight there. Uh, Will Cavendish, thank you for chairing. Um, fantastic, I think, to see the opportunities to connect cross sector. And we're just sort of starting to come out naturally. And, and I hope everyone in the room and online um, is taking away some, some new insight that you can take back to your day jobs. Um, we look forward to con continuing this conversation. Um, so thank you very much for everyone who, who joined online. We do hope to do one of these in the future where we'll be able to have more people in person. Uh, if you can sort out the strikes ahead of that, that would be very helpful. Um, so thank you. We will bring the broadcast to an end now. And with that, <laughs>